Hello, welcome. This is Florian Marquardt speaking, and this will be a talk that I would have delivered in Denver at the March meeting in a session on open quantum systems. So here you can see us near the registration desk, a part of my group and myself. Well, so in this talk, I'll first give you a brief introduction to neural networks, then a brief introduction to reinforcement learning, which is the computer science tool used to discover strategies, and then I'll tell you how this can be used for open quantum systems. And then finally, in the second half of the talk, I'll tell you about one of our works, namely how to apply this to discover quantum error correction strategies. But let me first start by telling you a little bit about neural networks. If you think about your brain, you can view it as an information processing device. So it has an input, maybe what you see or what you hear, and it has an output, which is maybe what you do or what you say in response. Now, if you view it in this simplistic manner, it's still a very marvel marvelous device. And the reason is that if you look at an arbitrary picture that you have maybe never seen before, you can instantly recognize it. For example, here a picture of a light bulb. You've never seen this particular perspective, this particular shape and lighting before, yet you instantly recognize it. And that is much, much more flexible than what you would have for a computer algorithm where you have hand-coded an algorithm. It would be basically impossible to achieve the same thing. And so half a century ago, computer scientists started wondering, can we build an artificial neural network, an artificial machine that can be as flexible as your brain? And so an artificial neural network is composed of neurons, each of which holds a single number at any given moment in time. They are connected and the connection strengths can be changed during training. Input uh, is fed into the neurons at the lowest, the input layer, and it's processed in a sequence of steps until you reach the output layer. And then finally, that's the output, for example, for image recognition, that would be the label. So this has been going on for half a century, but the larger community in science and technology took note basically since 2012. And that's when a deep neural network was able to beat all other approaches in one of those important competitions that they have in computer science, in this case, the so-called ImageNet, comp ImageNet competition, where you are given a million training pictures and you can do with them whatever, whatever you want. And this was the first time that a deep neural network was beating all other approaches. And since then, they've been better than uh, even humans. Now, since then, there have been many applications of neural networks in all kinds of areas. And specifically, that also, of course, includes physics. And if you think of where could you apply neural networks in physics, one of the obvious examples that comes to mind is wherever you have images, because image recognition is one of the strong points of neural networks. And so if you look at the, say, magnetization pattern in a sample, then it will look different depending on whether you are at high temperatures in the paramagnetic phase or at low temperatures in the ferromagnetic phase. And you can train a neural network to distinguish one from the other. And then you can also go to an intermediate temperature and have the neural network and try to figure out where is your phase transition temperature. Now, having said all this, you should realize that machine learning is not a magic bullet. So what I mean by that is the training of a neural network is a highly nonlinear and stochastic process, not at all well understood theoretically, even though, of course, people are working on that. The results do depend very heavily on the quantity and quality of training data. And even if the network works really well, having the network is no substitute for basic understanding of the physical phenomenon. And then finally, if you try to figure out what the neural network does, the interpretation really requires some care and effort. Nevertheless, neural networks can be very powerful and it can be fun to explore what they can do. So that's why we do it. This was, of course, only a very, very brief superficial introduction. And so if you are interested in learning more, I direct you to our website, which is machinelearningforphysicists.org. There you will find the videos and slides of a lecture series that I gave uh, twice in the last few years. Now, coming more specifically to open quantum systems and quantum science and technology, 
there have been a series of applications of neural networks in the last few years, two or three years. And I don't want to go through all of them. Let me just highlight one, namely the qubit readout, because it really involves an experiment by the Siddiqui group at Berkeley. So what they did was they fed the noisy measurement trace that you get when you send a microwave beam through a cavity that's coupled to a qubit. And you train the neural network to be able to extract from this noisy trace as well as possible the state of a qubit. Because you can train it on many examples where you do know the state that you have initialized the qubit in. And so the neural network can be told what the answer should be. So much for an introduction to neural networks. Let's now switch to a large domain of machine learning that is of great importance to when we think about artificial intelligence for the future. And that domain is called reinforcement learning. Now, in order to make the distinction to what I've told you before, I imagined what is called supervised learning. In supervised learning, you have many, many training examples. You know both the question and the answer, so to speak, you know the image and the correct label for the image. And that is like a teacher who's very smart teaching a student uh, to give the correct answers. And then finally, you can be happy if the student can extrapolate slightly. Obviously, the final level here is limited by the amount of knowledge of the teacher. Whereas if you think of a really smart student or a researcher, then you want more, then you want the student to surpass the teacher finally. And that is the domain of reinforcement learning. So in re reinforcement learning, no one tells you what is the correct answer. You don't even know what's the correct answer. But you want to figure out answers that are better than the answers that you would naively have. Or you want to figure out strategies for problem solving that are better than just random uh, trial and error. So the way this is done is you start by random trial and error, but then you keep the things that work and you reinforce those actions, hence the name. And there, hopefully, the final level is unlimited. So there have been a couple of spectacular examples in recent years that have illustrated the power of reinforcement learning with deep neural networks. Um, here I've listed two of these examples, playing Atari video games or playing the game of Go and other board games at a level that really surpasses human experts. Now, how does this reinforcement learning work? So here's a very brief introduction. Imagine some world here represented by these objects. Imagine a robot roaming around this world. And so in a more abstract sense, a computer scientist would think of it in the following manner. So the world represents what is called a reinforcement learning environment. The robot is the reinforcement learning agent that can move around and manipulate the world. And the idea is that there is an observation of the current state of the environment. Then the state is mapped into an action by a so-called policy. And this action is then applied, and it can change the environment, and this loop continues. Now, there are many different ways of going about reinforcement learning. But one of the most popular is based on updating this policy. It's the so-called policy gradient method. Let me just use two slides to give you a very brief introduction to that. So the, one of the cornerstones of this method is to say that this policy is not to start with deterministic. You don't deterministically map state to action, but rather you have a stochastic policy. So you know the probability of taking an action A given a state S that you have observed. And this probability, here called pi, has an index here called theta, that indicates the policy has been parametrized, for example, the parameters of a neural network, and these can be updated during learning. So to make things very simple, if you have this little robot roaming around, the state could be the position of the robot, the action could be the direction of the next move, and then you still have to specify what's good, what is your aim, and you can specify that by determining rewards, for example, here rewards for picking up a box. And so then the so-called policy gradient method, which is one of the most popular, and there are many variants of it by now, is very, very simple uh, if you think about it. You take the sum of rewards, you take the expectation value over many of these stochastic trajectories as you are 
implementing the policy. And you simply do gradient ascent. You do gradient ascent by updating the parameters theta of the policy so as to make the overall return better. Okay, so now how can we apply this to open quantum systems? So you would take your natural reinforcement learning setup, but your reinforcement learning environment, the world, is now replaced by an open quantum system. So that's an open quantum system. When you say, I make observations, that really means I make measurements, quantum mechanical measurements. I feed them into my neural network or whatever represents my policy. And then I use them to decide the, on the next action, the next control that I can apply to my open quantum system. So what we are facing here is really uh, a situation with quantum feedback. And what uh, reinforcement learning is about in this setting is figuring out a very good quantum feedback strategy to obtain some goal. Let's go through a couple of examples. The open quantum system, what, what's one of the simplest open quantum systems, is a dissipative harmonic oscillator, or if you want a physical system, just a cavity. You can drive the cavity, that could be an action, so you can change the amplitude and the phase of the drive. And you can observe or read out, you can measure the state of the cavity. The simplest would be a homodyne measurement of the uh, electric field amplitude coming out of the cavity, or you can think of many other kinds of measurements, maybe even nonlinear ones. You can have a photon click detector outside of the cavity and so on. You can go further than having a simple cavity mode. You can place a qubit in there. You can get rid of the cavity, and only have a qubit that you contr control. You could have a chain of qubits, or maybe a more complicated quantum device, something like a quantum computer, a small subset of a quantum computer. Now, on the next slide, I want to go through a couple of examples of how reinforcement learning has, applied, has been applied in quantum physics. And even before deep reinforcement learning with neural networks uh, came around, uh, there were a number of really imaginative applications. So for example, to the domains of quantum metrology, you want to measure something, uh, figure out a quantum state as well as possible. For quantum state preparation, even in quantum many-body systems. Or to discover optical experiments where you want to enhance the likelihood that your quantum optical experiment will give you a highly entangled state. And then in the beginning of 2018, a number of works came out that applied these very powerful neural network-based deep reinforcement learning techniques to the control of qubits, to the surface code, to quantum transport, and so on. And in the following, I want to focus on our work that applies these powerful deep reinforcement learning methods to quantum error correction. So, quantum error correction with reinforcement learning. What was our goal when we started? Well, our goal, generally speaking, was to apply deep reinforcement learning to quantum physics. And the way I introduced reinforcement learning, that means you have to figure out a situation where feedback is important. You observe something, and depending on what you observe, you do one or the other thing. Because that's where reinforcement learning is really powerful. That's the situation uh, people who invented reinforcement learning had in mind. So it's not just to optimize a pulse sequence. That can also be done, but really to include feedback. And so if you look around what could be a possible interesting quantum feedback application, well, quantum error correction is one of those. So you have a couple of qubits. There's noise acting on those qubits that would lead to a decay of quantum information. How can you apply actions and measurements to protect these qubits as well as possible? Now, of course, we don't have to wait for reinforcement learning to come around uh, to discover quantum error correction. There's been a range of different approaches. The largest class is stabilizer codes. The surface code is one example of those. But then there are more hardware-centric approaches like dynamical decoupling, where you have slow noise and you try to beat this noise by uh, 
um, flipping the qubit up and down. So there are many different approaches and if you are given a particular hardware setup you don't necessarily know which one is best or maybe there's a hybrid uh, approach that works best or maybe even if you know which approach you want to do how to implement it properly and efficiently in this particular hardware setup is not so clear. And so that's where reinforcement learning should come in. That's our idea. So coming back to our example, we now have these qubits subject to noise. We can measure them from time to time. We can decide using our policy what should be the next action. And the action is really a unitary gate. So it could be a bit flip or um, a controlled knot acting between qubits. And to make the game really clear, uh, let me tell you what really happens. So we imagine we initialize a qubit in some arbitrary superposition state, which is the state we want to preserve. But it's really arbitrary, so we don't know it. We can't invent a strategy that works only for this state. It should work for arbitrary states. And now I will show you a quantum circuit diagram in the usual manner. Time runs from left to right. Um, each line corresponds to one of the qubits. One of the qubits has been initialized in the superposition state. And now, if I don't know anything else, I will just randomly try out unitary gates. For example, a controlled NOT gate entangling qubits 1 and 2. So the second qubit is flipped depending on the state of the first one. Maybe I try another controlled NOT and another controlled NOT. But another action would be a measurement. So let's do a measurement at this point in time. Now the problem is, though, if you have paid attention, you know that this has entangled all the qubits and doing this measurement finally will completely collapse your quantum state and that's exactly what you wanted to avoid. So the question is, can the neural network, who initially is also very, very naive, using reinforcement learning discover something that really works? Let me just show you a few results. So here is four qubits, they're all to all connected, they even can all be measured, if you like, but they are all subject to bit flip noise, so from time to time the qubit state flips in any of these qubits. And so here's what happens during reinforcement learning. So the upper trajectories in the upper panel, they show the beginning of learning. The network is completely random, it does random stuff, it's not very good. But after a while it learns to avoid these really bad measurements, it learns to apply a sequence of C-knots that entangle several qubits, and what it really rediscovers in a sense here is the repetition code. So 0 plus 1 superposition is mapped to 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1. Of course, this is what Peter Shaw told us in the 90s, but it's nice to see that the network, without having been told anything, can rediscover this. And then it goes further. It discovers that, yes, measurements can help us, but only if you are clever and you're not doing a measurement on a single data qubit, but you're doing collective measurements. And you do that by doing two controlled knots subsequently together with some ancilla qubit, and then you measure the ancilla qubit. So that's a parity detection measurement uh, that will tell you whether uh, there has been an error in the state. And then it applies those periodically. So let me show you the training progress as a function of time. Here you have um, a measure of success, so the recoverable quantum information, we call it. I come back to that later. Um, as a function of training time, initially it's really bad, then it becomes better, at least than the idle operation, which is letting the qubit just sit there. And it becomes better by having these detection, parity detection processes, and finally even better than that by figuring out adaptive strategies to react to the possible errors that it encounters. So once it works for one setup, you can apply the same technique to arbitrary setups. Here are a few examples. For example, you can have a simple chain of qubits and you can only measure at one spot or more complicated topologies. And then for each of these cases, the reinforcement learning is able to figure out uh, what works. And it figures out many things on the fly. For example, it understands in a chain it's good to have a swap operation. But if I only provide controlled knot operations, then swap is not natively available. Still, it figures out that a sequence of three controlled knots really implements a swap. Or here, take this example. Um, in this case, it does not set aside a fixed qubit as an ancilla, but it figures out a better strategy for this particular case is to use controlled knots to swap quantum information around and then to measure different qubits because different qubits subsequently take on the role of ancillas. So there are many of these fine details that you can discover. And then you can, for example, compare the resulting uh, 
improvement in the coherence time over the intrinsic coherence time for all these various topologies. Now this all still looks like stabilizer codes. It's already exciting because no textbook tells you which particular gate sequence you would need to implement the stabilizer code for this particular little quantum module of a few qubits. But I want to tell you that the exact same reinforcement learning approach also can discover strategies that are completely unrelated to stabilizer codes. So here's a scenario. If you have a few qubits that are subject to the same, say, fluctuating magnetic field, so the field is fluctuating in time but constant in space, then there's a smart strategy where you exploit the fact that this is collective dephasing. So the ancillas, the denoted in red, feel the same noisy field as the data qubit that should store the quantum information. And then what the network figures out that you can just, so to speak, continuously or regularly measure the ancilla qubits, how far have they precessed in the presence of the noisy field. And by learning about the noisy field in this way, you could then undo the noisy precession of the data qubit. And this is really what happens, and it really discovers even an adaptive noise estimation strategy. So depending on what was the measurement result, it will choose the measurement basis for the next measurement on the ancilla qubits in one way or another. So this is all very encouraging. But I should tell you that these things do not simply come out of the box. You cannot just take one of those computer science reinforcement learning approaches, apply them brute force and hope that it works. It in fact gets stuck. So we had to introduce two key concepts that somehow rely on our physical understanding of this whole domain of quantum uh, memories or quantum error correction. And the first one was to construct a smart reward and the second one was to feed as much information as possible into the neural network. And it's legitimate to use a little bit of your physical knowledge as long as this still represents, so to speak, tricks that cover a wide application domain as they do here. So here's a smart reward scheme. So what we asked ourselves is, instead of rewarding the neural network only at the very end of the time evolution, by looking at the overlap with the initial state, it would be much better if at any intermediate state we could answer the question, how much quantum information is still left in this highly, highly entangled multi-qubit state after it has been subject to decoherence and all these uh, complex gate sequences. That's not so easy. But we figured out a solution that works very nicely and we think is of general use. So if you have, imagine two uh, logical states initially, 0 and 1, they are orthogonal. If we only apply unitaries, they will forever remain orthogonal, regardless of how complex these states become because of the entangling operations. So if there is some decoherence, of course, they lose some of their distinguishability. And so that can be a measure of how much quantum information is still left. And the probability to distinguish by an optimal measurement two quantum states, two density matrices, uh, is given in the way shown here um, by taking the difference and then the, and then the one norm. So um, that led us to a definition of a quantity that we call recoverable quantum information, which has many other very interesting mathematical properties. So you take since you are interested in the worst case, because some initial states may decay faster than others, you minimize over the initial state, that is the Bloch vector n for the initial state, and then that's what we call the recoverable quantum information. It can be defined at any point in time, usually it decreases, and the goal of the reinforcement learning will to make sure that it doesn't decre decrease too fast. So that's a good reward scheme. And then finally, we also put in as much information as possible because, you know, the measurements are very sparse. They happen only once in a while and then they only give one bit of information. We figured out that it's a much better strategy to do the reinforcement learning with a neural network that is very powerful because at any moment in time it's being fed the full quantum state. Now, that's a bit unrealistic because in a real experiment you don't have that available. So what we do is then we finally, once this network has discovered a really good strategy, we set up a second network that really only can act upon based upon the measurements. So this is a realistic network that could be applied in an experiment. 
and we use the first network that we have already trained as a teacher to teach the second network to mimic the same strategy. And this works surprisingly well. We call it two-stage learning. We think it can also be applied in many other reinforcement learning settings. Okay, so that was a quick recap of what's behind the scenes. And so in the future, we really want to apply this to, to many other settings. So one of the obvious settings is when you don't only have qubits, but let's say also other quantum systems around like cavities. Because that is the setting a circuit quantum electrodynamics and it's known that these cavities uh, are very long-lived and so sometimes it's really smart to store the quantum information in those cavities. And another interesting setting is displayed here to the right, iron trap chips. So these consist of small registers of a few ions each, they can talk to each other, but then once in a while you also shuffle, you use electrodes to shuffle around these ions. And now the interesting thing is this shuffling operation it changes the topology of the qubits. It tells me which qubits are now connected to which other qubits. This is not so easily interpreted as a unitary operation, but it is still a valid action for a reinforcement learning program. And so this is a natural playground, again, for the same kind of reinforcement learning. So, finally, everything I've told you in this example was discrete actions at discrete time steps. So that's very suitable if you talk about a quantum gates um, and a quantum circuit. But what about if you want to go a little bit closer to the hardware level, then you have to talk about pulses, maybe voltage trace as a function of time. And so that is the domain of continuous reinforcement learning. And so continuous can mean two things, but let's say for us, it can mean both continuous time and continuous control amplitudes. And so what we have applied this to recently is a cavity with a qubit. You can drive it. You can drive the qubit, maybe also the cavity. You can look at the signal coming out of the cavity. Maybe that signal tells you indirectly something about the qubit. Maybe you can also use the qubit to control the cavity. And then you can do things like quantum state control, quantum state preparation. And so here's a small example where one uses reinforcement learning to prepare an interesting quantum state uh, that is a superposition of two Fox states. So that's work with Ricardo. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. I hope I've shown you that using these powerful deep reinforcement learning methods one can really achieve a lot when it comes to controlling open quantum systems. Thank you very much.